Thanks, Sebastian. Yep, so I'm Michael Casey. Um, I'm a journalist by trade, author, done a few things at MIT as well, so it's nice to see Silvio on stage. Um, but I'm here with uh, a couple of guys who've been in the weeds, if you like, uh, of this sector for a while. We're going to give you a bit of a walk through where we've gone, where we're, where we're headed, and what needs to happen to sort of bring to fruition a lot of the big ideas people have. So on my direct right, my friend Matthew Rozak, who is uh, the, the chairman of Block, and he'll tell you a bit about what Block's all about, but it's, you know, it's doing, doing interesting things in the infrastructure around this. But also chairman of the Digital Chamber of Commerce, um, the founder of Tally Capital, and just generally a serial uh, venture investor in this space for some time. Jonathan Johnson, the, the new, to some extent, CEO of Overstock, although you've been in Overstock for quite a while in a different capacity, uh, but at the same time, the president of, of Medici Ventures. Uh, so both of you have a pretty big portfolio um, and, and a lot of experience here. So why don't we just start off by th thinking back a little bit, right? You know, when I met you, Matt, it was a, the, the North American Bitcoin conference, I think, back at the end of 2013, and there was a lot of buzz in the, in the, in the air. Bitcoin was almost approaching $1,000, or I think it just had at that point. Um, and the dreams were big. What did, what, where did you think we were going at that point, and, and, and have we, how, how, what does it look like now, uh, so, you know, six years later? Pretty funny what you were thinking about back then on what would happen uh, today. I thought uh, our refrigerators would be mining Bitcoin, we'd be paying uh, for things in Bitcoin, and have a, had a lot more of an evolved uh, future. Um, but uh, kind of looking back on it, now we're, you know, today's the 11 year anniversary of Satoshi's white paper, you know, uh, happy uh, yep. white paper birthday uh, for that. Um, uh, but it takes uh, a lot of uh, uh, tech adoption, education, and there's a huge psychology in adopting this tech, uh, you know, based on, you know, everybody outside this room that walks down, you know, Market Street or whatever, uh, you know, doesn't see the same things we see in terms of this like uh, future state of crypto and Bitcoin, et cetera. Uh, so I feel like on the one hand, we, we know a secret most of the universe doesn't know in, in a certain way. On the other hand, it, it is hard because that psychological piece, whether you're, you know, uh, your, your, your brother, uh, you know, neighbor, hairdresser, whatever, to uh, anybody else, it's hard to adopt uh, stuff like this because it's uh, the, you know, human nature kicks in, that last few headlines of, uh, Crypto was a hack or a theft or you know whatever, and that weighs on on people generally. Uh, but then the, you have this strong undercurrent of uh, more adoption, more volume, better wallets, better exchanges, uh, regulatory clarity on certain assets, and I think that undercurrent is uh, is starting to become more and more profound, which is uh, which is good. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, you know, I actually met Patrick Byrne at the, around the same time, not long after then, in 2014, I think. And Patrick was uh, making waves in this space. When the very, you know, Overstock, of course, was accepting Bitcoin early on, um, and then, you know, under your leadership and others, you know, took some fairly big bets in a number of different areas. T0 being one of them. Looking back from your perspective, I mean, what were you expecting back then, and, and where do you see things, you know, now as, in well, reflection? Overstock was the first you know, huge retailer to accept Bitcoin back in January of 2014. I think we expected Bitcoin to be more ubiquitous, cryptocurrencies to be more ubiquitous by the end of 2019 than they are today. Uh, we also saw blockchain, that underlying technology, is the thing that was gonna be really transformative. I think it's taken a little bit longer to get off the ground. I think there are several reasons for that. Part of it has been there's been a lot of regulatory hurdles put in place. Some of those hurdles are purposeful. Some of them are kind of ambiguity, where the regulators are slow to act, slow to, to define a new set of rules for or trying to fit old rules onto new technology. Uh, so things are moving along, uh, but probably not as quickly as, as possible. You know, the way I, the way I think of it is, Technological innovation has a steep, steep arc up. If you do time versus innovation on technology, it has a steep, steep arc up, whereas human adaptability is relatively flat. And I think part of the reason we're a little slower than we expected is the human adaptability to this new world-changing technology has slowed it down a little bit. And a lot of that's been in the form of 
regulation or slow to define regulation about what we want to do in the blockchain space. Okay, so the, the, the theme of, of this talk you know, is bridges, roads, and, and tunnels. And so, you know, part of that obviously refers to this idea of the infrastructure. And, and it's interesting that you were talking there about human capabilities because I think you could even slide into that definition, you know, regulatory, the regulatory framework as a, as a kind of a part of the infrastructure and also, you know, social awareness. I mean, this, I'm just trying to sort of force a concept into a broad picture here, but it's a it all speaks to the same process of building the framework, building the foundation so that all of the cool you know, ideas and applications that can be built upon this ex ex extensible platform. So in the light of that, and since both of you have uh, portfolios that are, are quite broad in terms of your interests, you know, nail down, if you don't mind, you know, where exactly are the bridges and tunnels and roads? What, what are the most important pieces of this? And, from, from what you see, from say, from what block and what, what Tally Capital is invested in, uh, well, for the, the, stru the structural build out. Yeah, I mean, there, I mean, there's a lot of work to do. Uh, you know, everything from the wallets, the payment processors, the exchanges, the miners, the software layers, you know, are getting better, but they're still not, you know, kind of functioning at at the kind of mass scale. You know, and it's uh, you know to, to Jonathan's point about. Uh, you know, humans being able to adopt this stuff. You know, if, if, if I was going to say, hey, let's uh, download Instagram and let's share food pictures, no big deal. What's, you know, what's the, uh, what's the loss there? If I'm saying, hey, download this money app and put a part of your net worth on there, you know, the, the trust bar is a lot higher. And uh, I think that the tribal nature of, you know, you, you trust certain people and then you'll, you'll do what they do. So I think in the adoption of crypto is a little bit wonkier and different. Um, but, but on the infrastructure side, I, I mean, things are getting better all the time. And, and you, you kind of look at maybe even at one of the more audacious goals for this space is the ETF and, and reading some of the dynamics on why an ETF doesn't exist today on the market structure, on the liquidity, on the pricing, and, and all those dynamics are kind of, you know, true. You know, being self-aware of this industry, a lot of those dynamics are very, very true in, in terms of uh, what is... Uh, not mature enough yet in this space. And, uh, and again, this is a snapshot in time. That's kind of today-ish. Uh, every single day, there's massive incremental change and, and uh, uh, improvement in, uh, in this space. But, uh, you know, wallets, to make them a lot easier, wallets are going to get more complicated because it's not just going to be send and receive. It's going to be, you know, in a proof-of-stake network, you're going to have other dials to turn and, and vote on and governance dynamics. So the wallet will evolve, maybe get more complicated. Um, but generally, the, the, uh, the infrastructure to make it easy for brothers, neighbors, hairdressers uh, still needs to get there. On the institutional side, uh, you know, the institutions are coming, and on a, it's like been two, three years of that narrative, but, it, you know, the, the wallet exchanges, the regulatory dynamics, the, uh, the custody, all those layers are still, for institutions, are generally wet cement, the way they look at infrastructure and, and everything else. And that's starting to cure, and we're starting to see uh, some of the biggest players in the world uh, making significant bets to uh, not only improve that infrastructure, but put their name behind it, which is... Again, you know, it's like uh, if you look at a Fidelity or some of these other um, massive custodians and, and uh, platforms, that's a lot easier to go to an investment committee and say, hey, we're going we're gonna to try this, we're going to start this, and this is uh, our partner in this space. It's a lot easier to do than if they didn't exist. Um, and so, you know, from the uh, you know, uh, Main Street level getting better, from the institutional level, I think, you know, we've got about another six months, year before we start seeing numbers really click in. And we're starting to see that if you look at, you know, uh, Grayscale's numbers or some of the other uh, CME or BAC numbers. That's all institutions pouring capital in. Uh, and that's testing the market. That's not even like an open uh, door. So I think uh, uh, so far so good, but we've uh, still got a lot of work to do. If, if, if I could say, you know, what do I think as we build the infrastructure is the road, the road that's going to touch every store, every person, I think that's a solid identity app built on the blockchain. Today, whether you're doing know your customer because you want a banking or a, or a wallet, or you're doing know your voter because you want a voting app, we always need to prove our identity. The blockchain will let us show our identity with only giving what we need to give to interact with 
people. And so rather than giving trivial arcana about ourselves that tries to prove we are we, we are the person we say we are, like a mother's maiden name or your second grade school teacher or some nine random digits that the government's assigned you, there should be something we access with our biometrics that gives us access to our own information on the blockchain, uh, on blockchain technology that is that road level infrastructure. As far as the tunnels, uh, I think it's things like uh, connecting Wall Street to Main Street, letting us democratize capital through things like T0 and, and other companies that are trying to give access to capital to normal Joes and not the elite of Wall Street. And as far as the bridges that get us from here to there, that's a tougher analogy for me to kind of stretch, but I ultimately think that's letting us vote, whether it's voting at a corporate level, at a political level, at a social level, uh, where our vote is cast via blockchain so we know it's safe and secure, we know it's auditable, but we also know it's secret and unique just to us. You know, when we think about this, this process of building out this ecosystem, you start to realize that like, it's not one company, it's multiple different pieces, right? Whether it's the identity provider, whether it's the underlying blockchains, whether it's people working on zero knowledge proof solutions and so forth. There's just countless different pieces to the ecosystem. So as putting on your investor hats, um, how do you go about that investment, pro that, that thesis? Do you, you know, you're just still sort of applying a, look, if this is an interesting company and I like the look of that, I'll, I'll, I'll buy into it. Or, or do you have a strategic approach where you think it's, you know, valuable to, to, to figure out which ones are the bridges and the tunnels and strategically placing your bets in that regard? What's the, what's the mindset, of, what should be the mindset of an investor towards this space in that regard? May I go first on this one? Please. So, so I think that we're looking for companies that have good technologists, but that also know their industry. This gets so industry specific that if you get a technologist and kind of a marketing guy together, they can solve, they think they can solve a problem in any industry, but without deep industry expertise, it's more theoretical than practical. The next thing we really look for is, are they building an application, a software product that solves a real problem? Uh, and will it be easy to use? And I think that's really important because so often you have an idea and you don't have industry expertise and you don't know it's just a theoretical problem that's you know, maybe solved with a non-blockchain solution already. So it's, it's finding an application that really works and then frankly not being obliged to talk about that it's blockchain based. Most of us don't care what kind of technology the apps on our phone are built on. Uh, we want things that are safe and secure and solve a problem. I think blockchain is going to do a lot of that, but if, it's, if, it's, if the whole focus is this sells because it's blockchain, that's probably not solving a problem in a way that today's consumer, today's user can understand. Yeah, totally agree with everything Jonathan said. Uh, and uh, I've made uh, 100 bets in this space, so a lot, a lot of the bridges, roads, and tunnels, a lot of tokenized networks, and uh, the, it's still a very human dynamic. So, so you know, good compass on the tech, uh, good technologist, a good go-to-market, and some of those muscle groups are, are kind of devoid between, um, you know, good capital raising, marketing, great technology, and then kind of falls apart on the go-to-market. You see a lot of that with some of these tokenized networks that are trying to exercise that muscle group that are just, just aren't able to do that. And I don't know if that's you know, trying to get the right developers to move from like Ethereum or EOS to this new blockchain and some of the, uh, the tribalism, uh, whether that can be uh, disrupted. Uh, but uh, most of the bets um, that I've made uh, had to do with a, a absolutely relentless uh, leader in that business because this is really hard technology to build out and scale and grow and you have a ton of challenges more so than the average uh, kind of tech company. So that relentlessness uh, of the CEO uh, is, is still down to that human level. Like you, you gotta make, uh, I'm betting less on the tech and more on that CEO because mm -hmm. it's just, uh, this is how it is in the earliest days. 
So I want to pick up on something that, that Jonathan was saying about not necessarily sort of having to use the word blockchain. And, 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 I, and I always like this, this reference, and I've tried various places that I've spoken in the past, I've, I've often asked for a show of hands. We're in the Bay Area, so I would hope there would be a lot of hands answering this particular question, but I'm going to try it anyway. So um, how many of you know what TCP IP is? Show of hands. Okay, that's a pretty good number, yeah. I mean, I would, I would hope so in this area, but so often when you travel, you, you just, very few hands go up, right? And it's this idea that, like, I'm, I'm using my TCP IP machine right now to, to deliver a message to you, Jonathan, right? No one uses that technology. The same way that we don't think about a car uh, uh, as an internal combustion engine machine, right? I don't have any idea how that, that engine works, but I still drive a car. So there's this abstraction that I think is, is a really important part of how we get to the market. It's literally... I think, I think, you know, we don't want to obviously make blockchain a bad word, but it, it doesn't, it, it almost necessarily needs to be removed from the marketing undertaking. And I just, I'd like to, this is this product fit challenge, right? With this, this focus on the end user. How do we get there? What are the, what's the language and the marketing that we need to bring to this whole process? Part of the thing, part of the reason I think we need to stop using the word blockchain up front yeah. is because people start thinking about mining and Merkle trees and nonces. And pretty soon you're down in this really geeky weeds that the average person goes, okay, I just don't understand this. Uh, what we really need to be thinking about are applications with a simple user interface. You know, I look at, I look at one of the companies that we've invested in, Votes, they're allowing secure mobile voting using blockchain technology. Well, they can market that as secure mobile voting. They've got a user interface that's it's an app that's really easy to download. The, interface is intuitive, that's the go to market. It's what are we giving with blockchain technology and is it lovely? Is it easy to use? Does it solve a problem? That's, I think that's the go to market is when I download an app, whether it's blockchain based or internet based, I just want to make it easy to use for whatever function I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally agree. I mean, that's, uh, and Vost is a great, great example where uh, you don't really uh, know that it's, you know, TCP, uh, SMTP, or whatever blockchain it's running on, uh, but it has that uh, end result of being secure and verifiable in terms of voting or identity or, or anything else. Um, we still have a, a lot of work to do uh, to get the core stable, the user interface, uh, you know, absolutely easy and, and uh, awesome to use. Uh, and, then, and then selling that to, to, to people and in the case of votes, uh, state, local, federal governments to use, um, that's, uh, that takes a lot of time and energy to do. What about the, uh, the sort of the public uh, policy, regulatory, you know, PR type aspect? And the digital chamber is actually a good place to, to frame that perspective, right? What, what, what more needs to happen and, and how can the, the community help get behind the right messaging. We've, we've been, uh, you know, privy to uh, some sort of entertaining hijinks, if you like, uh, in Congress lately. All of a sudden, the word blockchain and cryptocurrency has been thrust out of the open, but it, it doesn't seem to me as if the conversation is very sophisticated. Uh, how do we make that conversation more sophisticated? Yeah, uh, to, to, to do it well, you, you need uh, kind of the, the, the sandwich, the kind of the, the ground up and then the top down. And the ground up is happening. The top down is still uh, not as uh, prolific as we'd wanted as a country. Um, and, and so I've been meeting with uh, members of Congress, uh, various agencies, Treasury, uh, CFTC, you name it, uh, for not five weeks or five months, but five years. And I've seen the evolution to like, uh, this is drug money to now, this is everybody sitting up really straight in their chair and paying full attention to this technology uh, in a good way, uh, but are still, uh, kind of fumbling with the best way to approach it. Uh, you got other geographies like Singapore or Switzerland uh, that are, you know, kind of iterating on the regulatory frameworks uh, in real time to try and bring the tech and the people and the capital to those uh, to those geographies. And that's that's happening in uh, in in a pretty massive scale. I, I've been in tech for a couple decades and I've seen. Um, you know, people allude to, oh, I'm going to move to this jurisdiction because my tech is better, uh, kind of better regulations there. But in this space, I mean, families are just forklifting themselves to Switzerland, to Singapore without hesitation because, 
you know, in this, in this country, we still have, um, I think, a very uh, um, significant bottoms-up approach. But if we don't have the top-down, meaning the, uh, the White House and, and, and others saying that this is a strategic um, technology that the country should be pursuing, much like it did for AI in an in a, in a executive order or other things, that's super important, and we're still missing that. The fact that you know, all the fun with China and all the dynamics with Libra uh, you know, that is now a topic of conversation right. and starting to get, uh, starting to unpack a lot better. I mean, we've effectively had an executive order from Xi Jinping, right? I mean, we've, we've had the, 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 most, you know, the most powerful people in the world use the word blockchain, whether or not they're building something that should be described as a blockchain and what the impact of that is, no question, but how important is that to well, our I think movement? it's very important. Last week I was in Washington at a Chamber of Digital Commerce event with the Department of Commerce. And they were asking, what can we do as a government in the United States to advance blockchain technology? And you know, I gave them three pretty simple answers. One, make it easy for companies that use crypto or in the blockchain space to get a bank account. That has become a very, very difficult thing. Uh, second, let's have our regulators give answers and not sit on the sidelines and regulate through enforcement action rather than through through rule. I mentioned that to them that I'd been invited to Japan twice this year by its diet and its equivalent of the SEC because they're proactively looking for answers in the blockchain space where it meets capital market. The third thing I mentioned, and I think this is a big, hairy, audacious goal, is I think the administration ought to be looking at a US dollar that's digital based on the blockchain. The dollar is the global currency, and, it, and the U.S. has a tremendous uh, benefit because of that. There are all kinds of governments and institutions that would like to see that go away. From the top down, the government needs to be looking at small things like making it easy to bank, medium things like being responsive with uh, fast-acting regulation to help us define where the lines are, and then big, huge things like getting out in front of uh, getting out in front of digital currency with the U.S. dollar. And, and, and just another a point to that is, is the capital formation piece. You know, uh, if yeah. you look at every tokenized network, uh, they are setting up uh, special purpose vehicles, not because they want to avoid anything in the U.S., but there's a lack of clarity, so they go to the Caymans or Singapore or Switzerland, and uh, that's a lot of friction, but the capital formation should be in the U.S. Uh, there, uh, a, lot, a lot of those token offerings exclude U.S. investors, and so uh, that's a bad thing, and, and, and kind of looking at the continuum where we are in terms of the early days to, to, to today, the capital formation, the speculative flywheel of, of crypto is super important right now. And, uh, as, uh, and the capital formation uh, uh, and the funding of that will help get us to build the tech and get to adoption and go to market. But without that, uh, it's going to go elsewhere uh, or be that air hose will be compressed for longer than it should be. Well, that's great insights, guys. We, the, the, the clock is now flashing red at us, and so we're going to have to pull out. So a round of applause, please, for Jonathan and Matt. Thanks very much. Thank